little podcast action. <laughs> Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to our 200th episode of this show. I cannot believe this is the 200th episode. And I think you're supposed to do something, you know, ceremonial at these at these round numbers. At episode 50, I had a lot of fun. I think it took years to get to episode 50. And then I had a lot of fun and I went back and I rebooted the first episode, which was about looking at top scores and I expanded on that with Top Scores Part 2. And Cody, all I remember is we got to episode 100. And I said, let's do some fun stuff for episode 100. And that we just blew. I think episode 100 was like best back cutters on the Cleveland Cavaliers on Tuesday. <laughs> we blew right through that. And now we're on episode 200. And uh, I got nothing because we are in the midst of just a crazy NBA playoffs. This is what parody looks like. It's 1995 combined with 1976. The league is on the brink. We're, we're, we're moving through a wormhole to the other side of the future. There's these incredible three-man actions and shooting and movement and 116 offensive ratings as a league average. The Sacramento Kings run up and down the court like they're, they're marathon runners. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And here we are on the brink there are still eight teams left, and I think, I'm not even sure anymore, but I think outside of the Knicks and the Heat, anybody could win the NBA championship at this point. It's really, it's really anybody's game. I wouldn't be surprised if anyone were, were to win. As we record, four game sixes coming up. So you could be listening to this over the weekend. Hopefully people still listen to these over the weekend, and it could be... Final four is set. Conference finals are in play. We're done with this round. Everybody took care of business tonight and tomorrow. Or, Cody, we could be looking at not one, not two, not three, not four, but seven. No, hold on. So four game sevens. That's the max. That's the max we could have. Four game sevens. How are you doing? How are you feeling? How many game sevens are there going to be? What's the best game six? Please help, help me walk through this. First of all, first of all, I'm a little sad that we blew past the 200 thing because right, I'm sitting here with my list of 200 favorite plays in NBA history. So if we're not going to do it, I'll just let you know. Number 36, Jeremy Evans blocks Ronnie Turioff's jump shot, brings it down the court, and yams it on him. That, let's say that's that's number 36. That's number 36. So you can come back on episode 300 and I'll reveal another one of them. But one thing that also I take offense to this, Ben. You don't think the Heat can win? You don't think? The trash get ball playing Miami Heat <laughs> can win the championship because at this point, I honestly think, you know, when people talk about like debate styles where it's like, don't let the person drag you into the mud. Mm -hmm. That's just how they play. And I think they're so good at dragging the other team into the mud that I'm like, I don't know, throw this team against the Warriors. And I feel like at that point, the Warriors would be like, yeah, let's get in the scrum with with the Heat as well. So I honestly don't know what to believe with this team anymore. And I think they should just be involved with everyone that you've mentioned. Uh, I... I the Miami Heat, I was going to, I'm going to say like, I don't want to offend anyone that I know down in the Miami Heat organization because they've done such a great job. They're on the brink of their third conference finals in four years. And then I thought, no one's going to be offended by this. They're going to take this as a compliment. That team is like antimatter. They, if you, if you come along and you're like, I am this particle, I have, I have this power. The Heat are like, let me eliminate you from the universe. I know how to take you out. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it it. I don't know. You fine. All eight teams could win the title. Is that what you want me to, want me to say? Well, I was going to say all seven teams. I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure about the Knicks at this point, but I think the other teams do have a chance. And I know, like, it look, probably wasn't. Oh, oh look, say something. Look, yeah. the Knicks. This is not your big brother's Knicks, because this isn't even your own Knicks. From earlier in the season, the Knicks, the Knicks season turned around when Quentin Grimes entered the starting lineup and the emergence of uh, Emmanuel quickly off the bench and this dynamic second side action guard dominant paired with the offensive rebounding will get out in transition. Jalen Brunson, Emmanuel quickly, Quentin Grimes, a little Josh Hart even fit into that. Once we had the trade deadline, sometimes Obi Toppin minutes, and then R.J. Barrett, who I think has been great 
in the playoffs. He's been really good. But R.J. Barrett, instead of isolation, ball dominance, it's quick actions, attacking closeouts, spot-up threes when you swing the ball. That's what made the Knicks really fun. And the, and the Heat have done an incredible job of taking that away. But also, Cody <laughs> Julius Randle has two sprained ankles. I don't know what to make of him. I have to give him a little bit of a pass. Uh, quickly has been out with the ankle when Bam Adebayo, you, you know, dove for that fumble and it was a first down for Miami on that play. And then um, Quentin Grimes was injured as well with the shoulder. He comes back last night. And I know you have your top 200 plays in NBA history. I have my top 200 heroic moments in NBA oh history. Yes. And Quentin Grimes playing all 48 minutes after being out and shelved for a while. That's number 71 for me on that list. I had to move it up today. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, you know, don't rule out the possibility that, so it sounds like you've ruled out the, it sounds like you've got Miami penciled in for their third conference finals. Yeah. I don't, I don't see the Knicks taking two straight. Obviously I could be wrong, like, but there was a point yesterday in the game where they were, they were down by like 16 or something like this. And I think I sent to the rest of them, like this game is far from over. And I think when I was watching it, the recent, I'm dead serious. Cause when I was watching, I turned it on, I missed the first quarter and I'm like, the Heat are losing. But they're getting so many wide open threes. Like they were shooting, I don't remember what their percentage was. It was like 18% for a period of time from three. And I swear all of them were wide open. And the Knicks just like didn't understand how to guard any of their perimeter actions. Like Duncan Robinson, like is dusted off, like he was dusted off for the Bucks series, comes in, hits five of ten. He drops like 18 points in 20 minutes. And I don't know. That's one thing that concerned me. I'm like, man, if Miami's able to hunt down this these good shots in a must-win game for the Knicks. I don't know if they're going to be able to survive when that when that variance comes back to bite them in, in the next game. So I think that's the main thing. But, you know, first of all, Ben, I feel like I've seen in, in some comments somewhere that we've talked about Quentin Grimes more in this playoffs than we've talked about the Celtics. And that's probably true. And I'm going to add to it because Quentin Grimes, there's been a few possessions where I'm like, man, defensively, kind of pulled a James Harden in the corner at one point, got back cut really easily by Jimmy Butler, who draws the shooting foul. But then, if you want to talk about heroic moments, he comes back, it looks like he's done. Like, he hurts his ankle, he can't even walk, redeems himself by locking up Jimmy Butler. This is and this is on a play, him. just to yeah. be clear. This is not, like, he didn't go to the bench and he couldn't walk. What Cody is describing all happened within seven seconds of Earth time. This all happened immediately at the same time. He couldn't walk, then what happened? He, he can't walk, so he literally hobbles back to the plate. Like, he's kind of skipping along, and he's like, I guess I got to guard Jimmy Butler right now. Gets on Jimmy Butler. Butler tries to drive. He just strips him, just strips him clean, passes it off, and continues to just skip down the court because he can't walk, Ben. Like, you want to talk about heroic moments? That was the most heroic moments of these playoffs. That was awesome. I want more of that in this series. Okay, I, I told you this is going to hurt. But the Miami Heat, 45% three-point shooting in the first round, they were not a good three-point shooting team in the regular season. Now, that doesn't include Kevin Love, because I think Kevin Love getting out there and spacing and having extra minutes makes a difference. But, you know, the steady diet of Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, uh, even guys like Gabe Vincent, they're, they're not great shooters. Caleb Martin, they're not great shooters. Cody Zeller... Uh, Haywood Highsmith getting some minutes in this series. Cody, they're shooting they're shooting a, a, a salty 31% from downtown in this series. The Knicks are only at 30%. Mm. But going back to what we said and the reason why I still think New York at least has a, has a little bit of a window, although their souls just may be snatched from them tonight in South Beach by Jimmy Butler, who is, I think that's his specialty, is, is just finding a way to, to rip the hearts out of teams, the Heat, the the Knicks at least at thirty percent. You feel like if they can get back to some offensive process, that say, okay, R.J. Barrett, swing, you're open. Quentin Grimes, you're open. Take this. Uh, Jalen Brunson had a ton of great looks last game. You can see how it would be reasonable for them to make twelve or fifteen threes in a game, up that percentage over over thirty five percent, and steal a game. So. We we've spent like ten minutes on the least interesting series to me because now we get to the. The other what you you think you think this is the most interesting series? <laughs> this is a sick series, Ben. Like I could I could just dedicate the entire podcast to each of these games. Like we could just do gamers for this and ignore the other ones. Well, it's all games. relative. I'm just saying that if you had a power rankings, I think these teams would would be at the bottom in terms of championship probability. And let's stay in the East. 
stay in the East. We have a running gag of not talking about the East much in the last few weeks. But the Philadelphia 76ers, they are up 3-2. The, um, it's really interesting, by the way. The Sixers have a game six tonight at home to close it out. The Heat uh, have their game six to close it out. And the Lakers have their game six to close it out, which means three of the four lower seeds are on the brink of winning in a tournament where we already have an eight seed, a seven seed, a six seed, and a five seed in the second round. This is this is what parody looks like, my friend. Um, what was what was I saying? What were we talking about? I think you were going to transition to Celtics. Celtics, Sixers. thank you. Yeah, Sixers up three two, and the two. This is one of those series where the two close games, Philadelphia, won them both. Right. They, that get, first game, James Harden, and fourth game's James Harden. Big games, big shot down the stretch. And then in game five, I felt kind of like the Celtics' defense against some of the pet actions. Let's take the Harden and Bede pick and roll as an example. Now, I don't think this cost them the game or swung the game single-handedly because Philadelphia did a lot of other good things well. Embiid individually did a lot of other good things well. Harden individually did a lot of other good things well. Tyrese Maxey made shots, attacked closeouts. He was very efficient with his opportunities. Uh, And one more thing, because we're going to talk about offense, Embiid's defense has been really good in this series. Uh, the last game or two, I don't know because my I can't keep up with what's going on with my clips. I can't find some of my clips from this game in my notes, but I, he had like 10 plays at the rim in game five where either had a block or completely deterred the Celtics from shooting, including that vintage chase down block in the second half where sometimes you just have to marvel at how well that guy moves. You know, we started the year and I did this video called Joel Embiid is a 300 pound wing. And a lot of people were making hot sauce jokes and, you know, things like that. They were like, that's a that's a very big wing. You're going to be full after you eat that. But the reality is that translates a little bit to defense as well. Offensively, the footwork, the skill, his style of play facing up, uh, much like the area Dirk Nowitzki used to face up in around the foul line elbow area. That, that's true, obviously. But sometimes on defense, it's more than just his size. And to be able to come down the court like that and track blocks, uh, he, he just had this look in his eye like, I'm going to get this one. Timed up the steps. Absolutely amazing block. So all of that is to say, I want to focus on the Embiid Harden pick and roll. Because I think they only ran it ultimately like 20 times out of who knows how many half court, 60 half court possessions or whatever it comes out to. Uh, but in game five... To me, Cody, it felt like Boston got away from, okay, we're going to bring a third guy over to help really take away that catch when Embiid does the short roll. What do we call that? It's like a short pop. That's what I want to call it. Yeah. Because he's not really rolling. He, he's, he's stopping short with the intention of doing something around the free throw line. And this goes back to what I said about Harden. Some of his decision-making, pocket passes, Traditionally, left to right pocket passes are his sweet spot, but he's made a number of pick and roll pocket passes going right to left in this series and especially the last couple of games. And he's, we, we talked about this with Steph Curry. Harden is doing a great job of tempo and control on those actions, stringing out the defenders at the right pace, then boom, slipping it through the pocket once Al Horford commits to a certain distance to create that little gap. And I just felt like the Celtics were having a hard time, you know, like you don't want to give up 15 foot wide open jumpers to Joel Embiid all game. And even there was one in the fourth quarter, I think it might've been the only time they went to Harden and Embiid pick and roll in the fourth quarter. Um, Embiid got a wide open three because Malcolm Brogdon went under the screen And if you go under the screen, you would think that the big man doesn't have to also then drop and play the ball handler, but that's what happened. Horford also went with Harden. Someone actually helped off the corner for Harden, so three guys are on Harden. He just turns and pitches it back to Embiid, little pitch and catch for a wide open three. So I thought that was symptomatic of getting deeper in a series and feeling like you almost unfigured things out for the Celtics. It's like I I want by game five to sort of 
you've got your you've got your concepts of how you're going to defend pet actions and you've got them as tight as possible and it felt like it was going the other way a little bit for me uh with the Celtics did, did, did you have impressions like that how did how did you feel about this game yeah, so a couple of things that, that you talked about that I want to I want to add a little bit to. One of the things that I remember them doing, what the Celtics would do defensively earlier in the series, is when Harden and Embiid would run that pick and roll, Tatum would kind of be set up where he's defending somebody in the weak corner, but he's also sort of playing in between that and the spot where Embiid wants to do this little shallow pop sort of thing, right? And Embiid, and Tatum, what we talked about on the defense pod, he's so good at nail defense because of his length and his quickness that he could kind of play both positions. Now, I remember, I don't remember who was trying to make the back cut on that play, but there's one specific play where he shuts down that spot for Embiid to get there for an open jumper. I think this is back in game four. And then the guy makes the back cut, and I forgot who. I think it's Harden tries to make the pass down there, and Tatum's able to beat it there for a steal. And I'm like, oh, this is great. This is exactly how Tatum's been deployed. But like you said, I haven't been seeing that exact defensive configuration much at all since then. Furthermore, Ben, like the defensive cohesiveness of the Celtics, it just feels really off to me. Like that the aforementioned play you talked about where Embiid gets the wide open three. Harden drives. It seems like they send three of their defenders into the paint to shut him off. James Harden, who, Ben, James Harden is shooting 37% at the rim in these playoffs. He's shooting 37% at the rim. This is not one of the offensive stars in the league that you need to send extra help on his paint drives, right? I don't remember which podcast it was that brought it up, but somebody recently brought up that Harden hasn't had a dunk since, like, October. Like, this dude doesn't have his downhill verve that he used to have, right? And so there's just kind of, like... I don't know, the rotations seem off. It doesn't under, I don't understand where people are flying to. There's something about Rob Williams seems off where they can't funnel to him. Marcus Smart doesn't have the same defensive tenacity. There's just something, I don't know how else to say it, Ben, but the Celtics just do not seem like a collective whole on defense like I'm used to seeing them, especially last year when they went on their just the incredible defensive run in the second half of the season. Yeah, I mean, some of that could be a change in coaching. But to me, when I look at the personnel, you might say, well, isn't it exactly the same personnel, essentially, plus Malcolm Brogdon? I think Rob Williams has not been the same this year physically. And Smart uh, just looks like he's a little bit worn down physically. He doesn't have the same agility and pop. There was one of those uh, pick and roll plays I was reviewing this morning between um, Embiid and, and uh, Harden that we were talking about. And Smart needs to be the defender that zones up two shooters on the weak side. And he kind of lingers on the block. And that leaves a wide open three at the top for Tobias Harris. So they get the pick and roll. Harden makes the right to left pocket pass beautifully, which has not been a strength of his, beautifully. Embiid catches it at the free throw line. Embiid does a great job. Extra pass really quickly to Harris. Wide open three. So I agree with you there, but this series, it's its every game of this series. I mean, the series started without Embiid for game one. The whole series has been hard for me to really wrap my head around. Whereas like when I watch the Lakers series uh, with the Warriors, I feel like kind of every play, every step, I have a great feel for the dance, the push and pull that the teams are going through. This one, it's like, I feel like the Celtics are better, but certainly in game five, Philadelphia just looked like they had better process throughout the night. I thought they got better shots right from the get-go. And yet, in game four, Boston still had a number of opportunities to go up 3-1 in the series, and they obviously have had a number of games where they just look like a better team to me. Cody, I want to ask you this. What, what do you think the Celtics' offensive rating in this series is? Wow, what is their offensive rating? Oh, I'm going to take a stab at, like, so violent. I'm not going to take a stab at anything. I'm not, I'm not a stabby kind of person. Bitey, bitey, Ben. Bitey, bite. <laughs> um, let's say, like, 103. The Celtics offensive rating is 103. If it, no, that's the rule. That's, that's what, what I would say 109. 109. I'm yeah, say because 109. It, right, it feels yeah. low, right? It does feel really low. Okay, it's 123. The offense. Boston Celtics oh, offensive rating in this series is wow. 123. They are plus six in point differential because that's what happens when you lose two close games in a series. Celtics have won by uh, 34 points and they've won by 12 points. The lo they lost game one by four. They lost game four by one in overtime. So not only do you have a positive point differential when you look at the five games in total, but the thing that 
We just talked about the Celtics defense, and it feels like that could be tightened up. It doesn't feel like it has the same pop. But the other side is like, you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, the Celtics go through these periods where they have lapses and lulls and they can't make shots and et cetera, et cetera. Um, There's still a good three-point shooting team. They're shooting 37% in the series, and they've had a good offense all year, and they still have a 123 offensive rating. I do agree that it feels like at times they have no answer for Jalen Brown. And I wonder why he goes through stretches where there isn't more Jalen Brown exploiting a mismatch and then forcing Philadelphia to maybe adjust. But outside of that, it's still... Look, Cody, any series that goes five games in the NBA, the closest possible series is three to two. You cannot be closer than three to two. One team has to be ahead. And so it's like going into this game six, I can still see, all right, Philadelphia plays like they did for the last game, game and a half specifically Harden and Embiid continue to play very, very well on both ends. But by, by the way, tip of the cap to, Har- tip of the cap to Harden, um, his, I thought he's had good enough defensive possessions to put Philadelphia in a position to win. Like he's had some good defensive possessions for James Harden in this series, and I think that's really helped them at, at critical moments with critical actions. So if those guys come out there, um, home court advantage... Philly can close this thing and then they'd be a favorite to me in the next series and they're right on the brink of the NBA Finals. The flip side is, just like last year with the Celtics against Miami, you can see them coming out and just being like, we have more weapons, we're the better team if our shot falls back to Game 7 and it's back in our court. We haven't even gotten to the West yet. This stuff is crazy. I think, I'm going to admit something here, Ben, that I don't think you're, you're supposed to admit, all right? You get a lot of people flinging this bias word all over the place. People love talking about bias on, on Twitter and comments and wherever else. I actually, in this series, have been blinded by my own bias. And my bias in this is when I watched the series, in my I, I was so confident that the Celtics were going to run away with it that every game that the Sixers won, I kind of just ended and I was like, I'm not really sure why the Sixers won. Like, I'm not really sure what's going on here. It took me a while to start looking at it and be like, wow, maybe DeAnthony Melton is really locking things up on defense. Wow, maybe Tobias Harris is having a fairly efficient scoring uh, uh, series. Like, wow, maybe Joel Embiid's rim protection is like maybe the best besides Anthony Davis right now in the playoffs. And all of these things start coming together. It's like, oh, maybe James Harden passing with Embiid is really working out. And all of a sudden it's starting to, to congeal and I'm like, okay, Maybe it does make sense that this team is starting to win, but that's something that's really blinded me throughout because I'm like, oh, the Celtics are going to win. Oh, the Celtics are going to win. I've, Celtics are going to win to myself to them being down 2-3. So I would be vulnerable <laughs> with you, Ben, and admit that to you. I love this. This is why we're here. This is why we're here in the 200th episode to uh, to get on the couch and lay down and really kind of work these things through because I, I relate to that a ton. I go through this a lot. Let, let's go back to the Knicks Heat series. Patreon subscribers who read my thoughts about these series know that the one thing I'm really confident about is that everybody's close and I'm not that confident about anything. Uh, And the series I was most confident about was the Celtics and the 76ers. And I thought the Celtics had the upper hand in that series. And to your point, I still fully don't know what to make sense of it because I think 2-2 after four games with two close games going to Philadelphia, the way I see it, is the 76ers played well. Their process was pretty well, pretty good. The Celtics didn't disrupt anything in that process. By the way, one thing i got to mention about James Harden, he's using the mid-range more. And I think that's Mm. helping a ton. So it helps with the playmaking too, because this goes back to that control and tempo point. He comes off the screen. He's strong enough to hold a defender on his hip. He strings a dribble or two out. And instead of this all or nothing game we saw in Houston for so many years, he's working guys into 15 foot jumpers. The way he, the last time he really did this was back in 2015 with the Rockets. And then he started to play more layups and threes. But I think that's made a big difference because it complements those little pocket passes and playing this two-man game with Joel Embiid. Embiid plays great. Harden plays great. The idea of Philadelphia starts to come together. P.J. Tucker, 3 and D, a, a guy who can make playoff threes in the corner when the stars are overloaded on. You mentioned DeAnthony Melton, Tobias Harris. Uh, he's had a good series. And Maxi is the number three guy. I mean, Maxi's had some big games that have really helped Philadelphia. 
And so that's the series I was the most confident about. And it's like, that's still pretty close. I still gave Philadelphia pretty good odds to win that series. The one for me that I go back to is if you got Jimmy Butler on the heat and you have Eric Spolstra on the heat against what the Knicks have, how much else do you need to pick against that? In other words, if you think you have an amazing coaching advantage and you have the best player in the series, uh, how often do teams in that situation lose series? Because they do. The thing is, they do. And it's hard for me in retrospect to think if the Knicks were healthy the entire time, how much does that change? I'm fascinated in game six, by the way, in that series, just to see what happens with Josh Hart's minutes. Uh, I think he only played like 10 minutes in the game last game. So that I, I love kind of trying to go back myself and think about uh, – where did I get it wrong? Where does it look like I got it wrong? But it's actually hard to say uh, and, and kind of learn from those kinds of things. And I think the other thing, we're going to have a little bit of number time here. Like We should have some like music. It's like <laughs> no. Ben Cody's number in the, time. You know in the saying? first episode, in the first episode, I had number time music and they said it was too much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was it was kind of like an old Paul Schaefer. It was like spreadsheets. Get your spreadsheets. <laughs> when you say they, like when people just like say they generally, I'm expecting just like a, a cabal of people behind you, just like arms folded, like shaking their head when you do it. Um that's just my image when I do it. Anyway, number time with Ben and Cody. Here's the thing. If I were to say that the 76ers were winning this series right now, you'd be like, oh, wow. Embiid and Harden must be just like tearing it up statistically. They just must, must be off the charts. Let me read you some stuff. Embiid is scoring 26 and a half points on plus 1.1 efficiency. So he's shooting about one percentage point better than league average. That's not tearing it up, especially when we're thinking about like regular season Embiid, who is what, 35, 34 points per 75 on plus like five. James Harden, 23 and a half points per 75 on plus two efficiency. Neither of those are like, oh yeah, for sure this team is winning. I mean, Tobias Harris is the most efficient of like their main scores at plus six, but that's still not tearing anything up. And on the other side, Jalen Brown's one of the better playoff scorers right now. He's about 25 points per 75. I think he's about plus 5% efficiency. Jason Tatum statistically looks about the same. So I guess the offensive part feeds into it. Um, I don't know, Ben. This is a really enigmatic, I love that word, it's an enigmatic series to me, and I I will be interested to go back and be like, all right, where? how much did and where did my biases really cloud me? Uh, you want to talk about the Western Conference? Yeah, let's do it. Man, um, game six tonight in Phoenix, I have been impressed with Denver. I have, I have been impressed with Denver, mm-hmm. and you know, all these teams are very close together for me, so that is not to say that they look significantly different than the other top contenders right now. But the the Nuggets, I think, have done the stuff they needed to do to demonstrate, hey, we have a solid enough defense around Nikola Jokic. And also, hey, we have Nikola Jokic. Uh, because I don't know if anyone, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but uh, he's really good at basketball and on offense – looks absolutely incredible and I don't want to look ahead but if I you know if I had to say what gets me excited it's the idea of Jokic and Anthony Davis kind of rematching given how good Anthony Davis looks on defense and given how good Jokic looks on offense because Phoenix obviously is a team that is not constructed for defense right now Uh, I think they can hold their own. They can, you know, Kevin Durant has some strengths and Devin Booker has been better defensively and they play guys like Josh Okogie who can defend and and Aiton has some strengths as well. But just as a collective unit, especially when you take into account their depth and what they're trying to get on the floor when Booker or Durant go to the bench in this series without Chris Paul, it's it's not a defensive juggernaut. And Jokic, uh, his numbers in the series almost don't make sense. He's averaging 35 points a game. Uh, with 10 assists, 14 rebounds, if you just want to throw that in there, and uh, 65% true shooting. It's uh, it's wild, and it, it kind of reminds me of what you just said about Embiid stats, where during the year we've had this conversation about like the best scorers in the league and how easy it is to get into a series like this where 
all of a sudden Embiid's numbers in the series are like what you'd expect Jokic's. You're like, oh, 24 points per game from the center, and he does these other things. And in, in, in Embiid's case, it's defense, so maybe not so much with Jokic. But Jokic is the guy averaging 35 points per game in this series. Denver is, uh, much like the Celtics, plus six in the series in point differential after five games. They have a 121 offensive rating. They uh, Game two was close. So that was a close-ish game, but the home games in Denver, Nuggets have been plus 18, plus 10, and plus 16. Denver uh, is one of these altitude cities being a mile high above sea level where long-term studies across multiple sports show that the altitude conveys a slightly larger home court advantage for the teams that are used to playing there. So I expect that from the Nuggets. I expect the defense to be able to uh, move better and the role players, that whole that whole thing, Cody, that legendary thing in the NBA where you go on the road, it's a little bit harder for the role players to play well and make those big shots under the pressure cooker of a visiting arena and crowd. Um, the officials are obviously influenced by a crowd. If, if we, you know, if we learned anything from the bubble, it's that that's what home court officiating is. It's just people yelling at the refs <laughs> and putting peer pressure on them. So uh, plus 18, plus 10, plus 16, the games in Denver, the games in Phoenix have, I mean, we, we got another one coming up tonight. It's kind of amazing. They've been close. The Suns won game three by seven and game four by five. They went right down to the wire. And in both those games, Devin Booker was just... <sighs> do, do we want to finally do our top top players of the playoffs? Did we Have we have we done that? Because this, this whole Devin Booker playing like peak Michael Jordan thing, um, I mean, he was unbelievable in those two games. And for the games to be close is, is still really fascinating to me. Listen... Jordan didn't even put up these numbers. There's a couple of things I want to say about this series first, but when you say pressure cooker, watch out because you're specifically referring to Devin Booker when you say pressure cooker nowadays. Devin pressure cooker. Poker, oh, I screwed that up. I got to try that again. <laughs> Wait, is Devin, that... <laughs> the pressure cooker, Booker, Ben, because that... you know, if you lose that cadence, it's out. Is that on basketball reference? Uh, I don't think so. My goal is to make it be on basketball reference, though. I would love that. Let okay. me tell you something. Oh, Hold oh, on. Go on, your, go on your nickname thing, because I have some no Jokic numbers. That yes, before, before, you, before you tell me this thing, um, <laughs> you, you like stuff like Devin, the pressure cooker, Booker. Did, did you see this tweet? I think it was from Merriam-Webster today uh, about how we're all, we're all ding-dongs and TikTok. And, did you see this? Does this ring a bell? Wait, what? Yes, yes. No, it's really fascinating. It's about these kind of nicknames and language and how we're not dong dings and how the name of the website is not talk tick. And it's about IAU. So when you have this kind of, there's a name for it that I can't remember right now. But when you have these kinds of alliterative kind of uh, bing, bang, boom is a good example. It always Mm -hmm. goes I-A-O. The sound is always, you know, it wouldn't be bang, boom, bing. It doesn't sound right. So <laughs> I thought you, I thought you would have seen that. Anyway, continue. No, I didn't see that. Um, I can't recover from that. That's that should be its whole <laughs> segment. It should just be like word hour with Ben. We could just have a bunch of hours. We don't have enough hours a day. Anyway, Nikola Jokic, let, let listen to this, Ben. He is he has the third most points per seventy five during the playoffs right now. The only two players that are ahead of him, Devin Booker and Anthony Edwards. He has the second highest box creation in the playoffs, only behind Trey Young. He has the highest passer rating in the playoffs behind nobody because he's the highest. We're talking about right now top three passer and scorer going through the playoff. It's unbelievable the offensive display he's putting on. And when I still think DeAndre Ayton's done at times pretty solid job against him. And if I'm not incorrect, Ben, he's out for tonight's game. Right? I do not think DeAndre right? Am I Who's out? Am I catching you with this? Ayton? Isn't DeAndre Ayton out? I didn't I didn't know about this. This is this is breaking news to me. Did I make this up? No. No, you he's he's listed as questionable and now it says 1 hour ago he is to miss the game with a rib contusion. Cody, you are plugged in. I'm out here reading dictionary tweets about <laughs> uh, a blout reduplication. That's what it's called. <laughs> Click clack and and King Kong. Keep going. Blout reduplication. So yeah, Aiton's out. 
<laughs> and I think interestingly, even though we've seen this this offensive explosion from both Booker and Jokic, this has weirdly been a defensive series and how the teams are responding to them. Because we see like the Nuggets are whipping out their shift defense, right? Where, you know, two go to the ball, everyone else has to shift to the next guy. And I think in the last game, at least, Terrence Ross or the last couple of games, Terrence Ross, when he goes into the, into the weak corner, Jokic has been pretty slow recovering to that. And I'm like, oh, this might be a, a point of exploitation when it comes to the Nuggets defense. But on the other side of the coin, right, with with the fact that they're able to shift around so quickly, Devin Booker's passing, while I do think some of his reads have been good, I think he's been a little bit slow with some of those reads. There's one that I can think of for sure where Aiton was open for like a split second, and he kind of lofted in when the when the double team came, and I think Michael Porter Jr. was able to like neo it. Like he saw everything moving in slow motion. He's like, oh, this is mine now, and he just like appeared and stole it. And I think those are a couple things where like both teams have very easily exploited weaknesses, and it's kind of up to the defense and how they're going to be able to shore up. But without Aiton, I just don't know. I don't know, Jacques Lan- Landale? Jock Landale? I don't Jacques know why Landale. I called him the French Jacques. Sorry, Jacques <laughs> Sorry, that's what I, I, I do that. Yeah, I, I, was, I was editing our show the other day, and I, I think I called him Jacques Landale. And it's that, that first name gets me. I mean, here's my secret question. Have they been better with Landale's minutes? He's really banged and defended and rebounded. Um, it has at times felt like he's given them more productive minutes at the five position. So that'll be an interesting thing to watch tonight. He, he's not a guy who has been a deep rotation or a, a deep... He's, he's not a guy who has played a lot of minutes, let's put it that way, uh, throughout the season. And even in this series, averaging 15 minutes a game. So, I mean, can he give you 32 productive minutes tonight to keep this series alive in Game 6? By the way, shout out to Michael Porter Jr. You mentioned him. I think his defense in this series... I mean, if he defends like this, this is what Denver needs. He's given good defensive possessions size on rotation, uh, got to be aware of some of the actions and use that length. And I, I think that really, really helps um, Denver quite a bit to to say the obvious. Is there one more series that we should talk about? Do we want to talk about it or do you want to go straight to the best the best players? Let's go. Str- I feel like we should go straight to the best players. I feel yeah. like I feel like we already did this. Maybe we maybe we talked about doing it and we never did it. But uh, I think let's spend the rest of the show, yeah, let's spend the rest of the show talking about who we think the best players in the playoffs have been. I'll I'll let you pick first. Who do you, who would you who would you take as maybe the best player in the playoffs? If I give you if you give you the board and I say Cody draft away, who is who is the first guy that comes to mind for you? I think I think the number one pick is Jokic. Okay, in the playoffs so far. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I gave you a softball, and then you're going to pass it back to me, and it's going to be impossible. However, however, Ben, I, ha- I haven't heard I haven't heard any rumblings, so I'm going to start the rumblings here. Okay, I find this really fascinating because I, I've referenced this before in basketball reference. When you go to a player's on-offs, we like these players that I call full green players, right? Where you see their on-court numbers and then their on-off numbers. So it's like, how much better is the team than the opposing team when they're on the court? And then how much better is their own team compared to when they're on the court versus off the court? Jokic, you go to the regular season, full green, across the board, every season. The team is always better when he's on. It's always a better on-off. The playoffs, Ben. Let me read you the last couple of years, starting with uh, 2019-2020. Here's his on-off number. So his own team compared to when Jokic is on the court versus when he's off. In 2020, negative three on-off. That means the team, that means the team is... Th- Three points worse per 100 when he's on the court. That is correct. 2021, negative 8.2. 2022, negative 16.5. And this season, Ben, negative 4.3. Why? Why is the on off regular season god showing some of these negative indicators the last couple of seasons. What's going on here? Should I should I be selling all my Jokic stock to refer to last episode? Should I not be drafting him first? What what am I doing with these numbers? Well, first of all, those are basketball references numbers, which use a slightly different calculation than what we prefer to pull from the play-by-play. If you pull it from the play-by-play, if you go to thinkingbasketball.net for subscribers, Jokic is actually plus 2.2 right now, meaning the Nuggets are about two points better per 100 in these playoffs with him on the floor. And and maybe that segues to my 
first big thought here, Cody, which is if he's minus four on basketball reference and plus two using the actual play by play, that just shows you how small the sample is, man. I mean, this three, 378 minutes into the playoffs so far, 10 games, it's still extremely small to the point where my first thought is noise is causing this. Now, you might say, even if you look at his whole career in the postseason, you look at 2019 when they um, played two seven-game series, you look at 2020 when they went to the conference finals, you fold it all together, Jokic has played over 2,000 playoff minutes, over 58 games. It's a decent little sample for this kind of on-off stuff. Noise is less of a concern. And his overall value in the playoffs in that career is is plus two on-off. What we want to see in a long-term sample is plus seven, plus nine, plus 10. What we'll see from the best players ever in a long-term sample is usually something like plus 10, plus 12. So to me, it's mostly noise, but I do think there is a little bit of a signal maybe with defense. You know, in the last couple of years, what's happened to the Nuggets defense. But I think you also have to contextualize that in those small samples and those small series. Like in 2022, who who were get who was getting playoff minutes for the Nuggets in 2022, Cody? I mean, I, it's like we've forgotten this. The, the the leading minutes guys in the playoffs after Jokic and Aaron Gordon for the Nuggets last year Will were Barton? Will Barton, Monty Morris. Mm-hmm. Je- now Jeff Green's still there, but Austin Rivers, Bones Highland, Bryn Forbes, Jamichael Green, and Demarcus Cousins. So you have a mix of guys that are out of the league at the end of rotations, can't get in rotations on good teams because the Nuggets were injured and down so many key players and because they've made really nice moves in the offseason to upgrade the role players around the stars that are now back. And it's the same thing if you go back to 2020. In 2020, that was the season where Murray injures – sorry, 2021, Murray gets injured. And, you know, by the time you, you advance there, it's a very similar thing. They, they had to play the Suns, and they were shorthanded against the Suns. So I think it's largely a sample noise thing. I think it's also a little bit of a sample matchup with the team and what's going on in the dynamic. And to me, because when you look at the overall numbers, they're still a little lower than you would expect from the regular season. I do think there's probably a little bit driving that down that is something like, defensive vulnerability in some of these situations in the playoffs. Okay. So with all that said, you don't think it's a bad choice to take him number one as the best playoff performer right now? No, I don't. I don't. Okay. Um, okay. Just make it sure. Just yeah. It sure. I mean, I didn't know we were we were committed to to ranking these best performers, but he does look like, uh, if, you, if you look at our board that we have for playoff stats, he's number, I think he's number one in, yes, he's number one in box plus minus. And he's number one in our augmented plus minus, which it tries to not just look at the box score and include these pl- these plus minus numbers that we're talking about. And he's kind of out on an island. Devin Booker is the only other player that's had the same kind of super sexy box score. Um, but I, I, I mean, speaking of Devin Booker, where <laughs> where would you put him in your play? I mean, would you would you agree that he's been one of the, you know, very, very top playoff performers here. The question is where? Three, four, five, you know, something like that. I think if we're talking strictly these playoffs, how have they been performing? I, I kind of think Devin Booker's just number two in my book. Hmm. Yeah. I think he's number two. Yeah. I think if I think if you exclude the fact that there's going to be some shooting regression and you can't shoot 80% from the mid range all the time, like he did in the, in the two games in Phoenix, which is just still mind boggling. Uh, let's, let's look at the other candidates here. To me, they're Anthony Davis yep. with the Lakers and just what he's been able to do defensively. Um, Steph Curry with the Warriors yep. and Jimmy Butler with the heat. And I think that's five guys, right? I think that's how we originally were, we're planning on talking about this. What is your all playoff team? I think that's my all playoff team. Is that is that legal? Did I violate any rules positionally? Wait a second. Are we making this an all playoff team now? 
I don't know what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> I thought that's what I thought that's what you originally proposed way back. Well, we started drafting, and I'm like, oh, okay, we'll we'll draft. Let's we can draft. It. You mean I have to take a player number two if we draft? Do, do you want to do it that way, or do you want to build a first and second team? No, I want to build a first and second team. That sounds easier. Drafting All right, so our first team hard. is we have we have Jokic, we have we have Davis, we have uh, Butler, we have Booker, and we have Curry. Well, let's let's just go through them really quick. Okay. Davis. <clears throat> Arguably the best defender in the playoffs. I think if you said total impact over the course of games played in their specific series, Anthony Davis, to me, slam dunk number one defender because he has warped the game for the two opponents that they've played. First, the Memphis Grizzlies, um, where, you know, okay, they don't have the outside shooting. They were shorthanded with their front line, but... He just takes away the paint. He just completely takes away the paint. And even in their case, you know, he can guard Jaron Jackson, who was one of their better offensive options in, in man situations. And then you go to this series. This series has been fascinating because the original strategy in the series that the Lakers were basically set up to play, that Darvin Ham had them playing, where they sit on top of the shooters top lock them and funnel them back into the paint to try to take away the three-point line. That's all because Anthony Davis is just completely dominant in there. So no one wants to shoot around him. So for they've played five games in this series. For most of the series, Anthony Davis, when he's been on the floor and in the paint, has owned the paint. When the Warriors can pull him out in the pick and roll or get him switched onto a shooter where he can't leave them comfortably they've been able to score or get free throw opportunities at the basket. So I think I made this joke after game one, but it's not really a joke. There are times when it feels like he will impact like 25 or 30 shots in a game, which is just not like every time a dribbler gets near him, they're like, Nope, can't take that shot. Got to go back out and reset the possession. And every time one of those possessions goes from like 125 offensive rating down to a hundred, that's Anthony Davis. And he just keeps having that impact over and over and over and over again to say nothing of the the scheme flexibility and versatility that sets up that entire thing in the first place. So to me, his offense, which now I don't, I, we got to talk about this real quick. What, can, did he just automatically decide to shoot well in the mid range in the playoffs? This is exactly what he did in the bubble. He's like, oh, actually, I was joking. I'm actually a really good mid range shooter, but only what I want to be. Um, because that just makes him like such a two-way force. Yeah. To, to me, the offense is already good as a role man, as a post man, as a mismatch guy, as an offensive rebounder. But you add in the little isolation, end of clock, mid-range stuff, uh, or you play pick and roll and you sag off him and you concede the 17-footer and he's making 55% of his mid-rangers. That all of a sudden bumps his offense up a little bit more to me. And the two-way impact of that, as we said, I think last episode... Uh, puts him right up there with just about anybody in the league in my mind. Yeah, he's currently shooting 47% for mid-range in the playoffs, which this is a guy that during the last, I think, the couple seasons where people were starting to be like, oh, wait a second, if you actually stack up his mid-range shooting, he's worse than Giannis from this position. Yeah, so yeah. even though his stroke is, he's definitely in the club of like the best stroke that's not quite as effective. Uh, but yeah, And he, his and he stopped shooting threes good. as well. He's yeah. just like, oh, I don't need to waste these shots with three-pointers when it counts apparently. So we have, we talked about them. Jimmy, do we need to talk about Jimmy Butler more and why he's on this first team? I I think we do. Okay. Yeah, I think we do. Um, You are a huge Jimmy Butler fan. I will let you explain sort of the, the Jimmy Butler experience. So aside from like Curry, who I think is just like the top of every list, Jimmy Butler is probably the best chaos basketball player in the league right now, like if if the possession just goes haywire, right, and everyone's just kind of all over the place, there's like a calm. He gets like a sense of calm, which is why I think he and Spolstra work so well together because I think Spolstra is also a chaos uh, coach and he thrives in those situations. And there's something about just being able to be like, 
I love the chaos. I want to bring everyone into the chaos. Kind of throws everyone off their game in a way. And I know I'm talking like these abstract sorts of ways, but it's kind of the only way to really understand how good Jimmy Butler is because it's like not traditional stuff. He's good at like, I don't know, he can space the court well, not necessarily because he's a great three-point shooter, but he randomly makes them. And then if you look away for a second, he's great at cutting. He's great at charging in there and tipping away for offensive rebounds, getting new possessions. He's great at being physical in the paint and he loves being physical. Uh, defensively, I forgot who it was, but he absolutely swatted someone's layup at the apex during yesterday's game. It might have been Brunson, but I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, he's just really versatile. In I think a way it was that Grimes. Really, was it Grimes? In the one where he tried to cock it on him and dunk in transition. I didn't think it was a dunk attempt. It was a it was a floater because he went up there and met it pretty high up. On okay, the he apex. got he got Grimes. I think at some point in transition as well. So yeah. Anyway, and keep going. That's kind of my thing. Is he can kind of be deployed pretty much anywhere and he's effective doing all of it and there's also something about the playoffs where he just elevates his ability to do that now he's scoring 30 points per 75 and plus eight and a half efficiency so the numbers are even backing up for how ridiculous he's been i don't know he's he's just fantastic he does have like a mid-range sort of he likes a fade away he likes that move where he drives, gets the big pivot foot, swings back and and creates space that way. But otherwise, a lot of his scoring is, oh, here's an opportunity to drive and use my size and strength. And he's a huge guy, 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, um, I'll get free throws or some angle for a layup. I'm going to back cut and use my body. I'm going to get a seal. I'm going to get a seal down in the post on a smaller player. He might be one of the kings of getting out in transition, just like Anthony Davis, getting an inside position on someone, waiting for the lob pass to come. It's the exact same play we talked about at the end of the Milwaukee series where he holds his own under the basket and then catches and finishes. So you get like a ton of baskets like that. You get that whole chaotic Miami thing where like there's like a block and a loose ball and a fumble and it ends up in the corner and all of a sudden Jimmy Butler's got a layup and you're like, oh, he's up to 22 points, but I don't remember anything happening on offense involving Jimmy Butler. The defense, we, we, I think we talked about him. He does come up in our all defensive awards episode that, that we do annually. Just great in passing lanes and very versatile and switchable and a very, very smart, heady defender. And in these playoff situations where you create a lot of ball pressure and you create a lot of chaos. He gets his hands on balls and the Heat also use that. It's like, again, the same thing. It happened in the game yesterday. Defense to offense is a big deal in these kinds of situations in these series where we do all this analysis on half-court offense and who's set up in the pick and roll and who's guarding who where. You get 15, 20 possessions a game where you get either a long rebound or a turnover and that creates transition and a run out. All that stuff goes out the window. And it's about, you know, odd man breaks, four on three, four on two, three on one. It's about decision making. And it's about cross matches where now you're coming down and you're like, oh, you're stuck with Jalen Brunson trying to guard Jimmy Butler. And they just throw it to him in the post or he gets an offensive rebound. There's no schematic thing there. That's just there was a turnover, right? And then Jimmy Butler has an offensive rebound because of the turnover. Defense creates offense, and all of a sudden, you're up by 12. And I thought I actually thought it went the other way in the game the other day with the Knicks being able to stop Miami and then turn that into easy offense for themselves. Let me ask you something, Ben, because I think I, I thought of this when you were talking here. This is the thing that I think encapsulates Jimmy Butler's game. If you were a coach and you're trying to come up with a defensive scheme, what what is the best way to defend Jimmy Butler? What do you want to set up for him to do when you're out there? I would go under on pick and rolls. I would give him a huge driving cushion personally. Now, plenty of teams have done this. You can experiment with this because two things happen. One, he makes his shots. He makes threes and he makes his shots. And that might make you change your mind a little bit, especially because of the psychological head games of Jimmy Butler. These kinds of players are so fun, by the way, <laughs> Cody. Like guys that really make you think like, wait a second, is he really a 30% three-point shooter or is he really a 40% three-point shooter? Makes no sense. He's taken hundreds of threes. He's not that good of a shooter. His wide open three-point percentage, this is something we track for Patreon subscribers uh, at thinkingbasketball.net. His wide open three-point percentage for the last three years in the regular season, Jimmy Butler is 36%. That's it. In the playoffs, it's 34%. 
So there's like the actual shots that are going up. There should be nothing making you go. Jimmy Butler is secretly a 40% three point shooter, except if you look at his pull up shooting, this is where it starts to mess with your mind. Uh, 21% on pull up threes in the last three years, Cody, in the regular season. That's what he's shooting. Shooting 20, 21%. That's bad. That's really bad. <laughs> yeah. In the playoffs, that goes up to 34% oh my God. over the last three years. So that might create this like psychological impression that he's been able to do these things. But for me, I would definitely sag and give him a cushion and dare him to shoot. I would definitely go under on the screening actions. And then I think you have to figure out, just like the Knicks have, where R.J. Barrett has had a number of great possessions. You have to figure out, can I get the right body that's not going to get abused and I'm not going to get those switches. You know, you have to, you have to make sure you don't get him on a small body because uh, he will power that guy down low, essentially like a post player, essentially like a lighter version of a LeBron James or an Anthony Davis. Shout out to RJ Barrett. Mm-hmm. He blocked Jimmy Butler in isolation yesterday in the half court, timed him up. And then a possession or two later, Butler got a steal, I think on a, on a Barrett pass. Uh, and they were running down court in transition together. Butler was on the right wing. He was going in to score. And Barrett just is like running with him, timing him up. Like, I'm waiting for you to do something because now I know how to guard you. And he almost completely sent that shot. Butler missed it by six feet. It was an air ball shot to the other side of the basket. Knicks came down. I, I love those little interplays. So that's part of the answer to your question. You kind of have to see how the players feel out his angles. And if they can get something going... If they can't, um, then I would go to phase two with defending Jimmy Butler. But that would be my phase one. And it, it almost just seems like it doesn't matter because it's it's not necessarily like he's on ball all the way, all the time. He just gets off ball and somehow just like creates the sorts of advantages and plays that he wants to be in. So you can play him this way, but then he just ends up being, you know, in these chaos sorts of games. Yeah, he has a great feel for those kinds of things. Where to be, where the ball's going to go, loose balls, positioning his body, cutting. Um so that's our that's our all playoff first team, right? We have Jokic. You want to talk about Curry? Jokic, we, talk, we talked enough about him. Jokic, Anthony. I just want to. I we have five, right? Yeah, Anthony yeah. Davis, Jokic, Jimmy Butler, Devin Booker, and Stephen Curry. It's like a beautiful one through five team. Yes. All those positions work. I, I think the only thing I'll say with Curry, uh, no, let's leave it. Let's leave it for another show. I think we've yeah. we've talked enough about Curry. Let's get to the second team. Okay. Before we get out of here, the second team gets a little bit more interesting to me. Do you have? I'll say. I'll. We'll. We'll do it again. I'll give you the first pick. Do you have an immediate guy that jumps out? Maybe in the group below those five that have had such a good playoff run. I wouldn't say he's necessarily my first, but the guy that jumps out is James Harden, second oh, team All Playoff over Embiid. See, I was. I, didn't, I don't <laughs> want to create like a. I don't want to create that, but. I don't know, man. James Harden's been so good at setting up their the Philadelphia offense. And I don't necessarily think they have a lot of guys that create in the sort of way that he does. So he sort of has this uh, creation burden. And he's also just like more of a sense of the moment. You know, James Harden's really stepped up, had those two huge games that, you know, like we talked about, the series is very close. And those two close games were because he was able to do that. He was able to steal a win without him beat on the court. A couple of those things really scored highly for me. I've been I've been very impressed with Harden. I think he's he take he makes my second team. Okay, I think I would have him on my second team, but I think Embiid with the defense and mm-hmm. then the pressure that he applies. I, I hate to do this at the end of the show because to me it's maybe maybe the most important thing we'll talk about today conceptually when we talk about these players and it applies to the stuff we talked about in the first half of the show with the series, the four semifinal series so far in each conference and the looming game sixes and game sevens. When you have a player in an individual playoff series, Cody, that dictates all the other stuff, there's a ton of value in that because if you remove that player, it changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. Like one of the things I was going to bring up about Curry, um, and it's part of a larger conversation, but I'll, I'll insert this one point here. The Golden State Warriors offense in the playoffs with him on the bench over the X number of years, like four years, five years, six years, it doesn't matter how you cut it, in this dynasty has been terrible. There's just no other way around it. 
I think the again pick the pick the years, but we're talking about offensive ratings that are like 103, 104, 105, and part of the reason for that is we all know about his skill and his gravity and his movement. But when he's off the court, how are teams needing to defend Clay Thompson and Draymond Green? And in this iteration, Jordan Poole and Andre Iguodala and Andrew Bogut and Kavon Looney. How, how do they need to defend those players? And the answer is they don't really need to do much to defend those players. And it's, it's not a slight on, you know, the defenders around Anthony Davis in Los Angeles or the guys around Curry or the guys in Philadelphia around Embiid. It's just this point about when you have players that dictate that much it inherently creates a ton of value because it's like, oh, that's how all the role players get shots. Or on defense, it's like, oh, now we're not really vulnerable. We just have to figure out how to funnel guys to Anthony Davis. And the good defenders become great and the bad defenders become okay because we have this backstop and this strategy that hides and protects and supports everyone. And so I'm a, I'm a, big proponent of that, especially if I look at just like a single series playoff analysis and we're only two series in right now. So Embiid's numbers, his scoring numbers may be down, but part of that is because in the first round, the 76ers were like, we're going to double team you every time you touch the ball and you got to move it and make other guys score. And that doesn't always get picked up in the box score. I think, no, I agree with that for sure. I really didn't want to put Embiid down because again, like the rim deterrence thing, there are so many plays where the Celtics drive into the paint. They're just like, nope, we're going to kick it out. It looks like I have a layup. I think there's one play where he has like three rim deterrences from game five where both Brown and Tatum are all just like, nope, we're not dealing with any of this in here. So I'm very okay with just like putting them in as a duo. Yeah, I think they would both be on my second team yep. um, with Jason, Jason Tatum. I think. I- I think would be on the second team, Kevin Durant. Does that does that sound reasonable? Are you with me? Let's, how are we? How are we doing? Let, let's maybe let, let's put Durant you, as a maybe. You have a maybe. Okay. Yeah. You, we're we're gonna g- maybe Durant. Give me a few other guys because I'm I'm I, it starts to get really hard at this point for me. What about Jalen Brunson then? <sighs> yeah. He's Boy. been in, in, with a Knicks team that's really been struggling to find consistent offense. He has just he played forty like like Ryan he played, played all forty eight yeah. forty eight minutes and just like when things aren't working again he just slows it down and gets some of these grimy step back gonna blow by people. There's one Jimmy Butler's overloading one side. He slices through, gets his layup. There's so much that he's doing for their offense. And I know the numbers don't jump out as being like this hyper efficient scorer, and he's not necessarily the best passer in the world. Though I think his pass against creation's been pretty solid so far these playoffs. I, I don't know. I think the Knicks would just be so lost without him. Oh, I agree with that. I agree that he's a great fit for the Knicks. And I think if you were doing this based on like a team value thing, mm-hmm. if you were like, can we, out of all the teams, you know, if we're talking about 10 spots on our all playoff team, there's only eight teams playing right now. Can you find 10 guys that have clearly been more valuable for their team than Jalen Brunson? I imagine the answer is categorically no. Yeah. And part of that is like the second best player on some team. Is he more valuable than the best player on another team? So if you're talking about the value for the Knicks, I completely agree. My reservations about Jalen and, and longtime listeners of this show know that um, you and I have been big fans of his game going back to Dallas. We've actually done a couple uh, spots uh, of videos on his game before. Uh, the, the Brunson burner, we used to call him around here because of that, that scoring. Um, his ISO scoring, I think, has shown to be somewhat resilient in the playoffs. His efficiency is low right now. It's about four percentage points below Uh, relative to the opponent. So that's not good. Minus four scoring is not good. But I do think in general, the style of his isolation scoring from the short mid-range, the footwork, the ability to get fouls with all the up fakes and the old man YMCA action that he gets into, I think that has been pretty reliable. I think to me, the reservation, if I'm saying who are the 10 best players in the playoffs overall, his playmaking, and it's so, so much of this is his size, But his playmaking limitations and his vision have allowed teams and really the heat to load up on him at times when he has the ball, get the ball out of his hands and not really pay much of a tax because of course he's good enough to make some passes. 
I mean, he's been this way since Villanova. He's not a bad passer per se. But when you handle certain pressure situations and you really don't have to worry about, oh, he's going to skip it or he's going to immediately find someone open on the, on the strong side because we're cheating off the corner or whatever, uh, compare that to like watching, we'll use the extreme example, watching Jokic. As great of a scorer as Jokic is, the second you start throwing him stuff, you have to immediately worry about every, you're like, okay, the guy just left might be a layup. The guy who I'm cheating off of in the corner, he might do one of those things where he's like looking to the right and then he skips it 90 miles an hour across the court to his left. So that's the, that's the part with Jalen that, that holds me back a little bit. But as I say that, I think the question is like, who else, who else would you put up there? Would you put Jalen Brown up there in this conversation as well? See, while you were talking about Brunson, I was also thinking about Durant and the way that, that, uh, Denver's been able to crowd him and kind of force him into some com- uncomfortable positions and kind of revealed that. But also on the defensive side of things, I think he's shown himself, especially with some of that help side rim protection, super valuable for that team. I think I was underrating Durant. Durant should probably be like a sure in with this. With this a lock. Team. Yeah. 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 yeah so I, I'm, I'm going to backtrack on that. I think he's the last lock for me on the second team. I think the question for me on the second team is Jalen Brown. I'll throw some names out there. Jalen Brown, Jamal Murray. If you want to go back around Anthony Edwards, Mm -hmm. um, where else does it? And and Draymond Green for his for his defense, I think you could also consider as a candidate there. So you're not you're not subscribing to the belief that uh, the Lakers run is because of LeBron's just taking over brilliance. (laughs) No, LeBron, his foot is messed up, yeah, and I think it's. it is both admirable and sometimes painful to watch because you know going back three months that he, he would have better burst and better agility on these plays. And sometimes he does make great plays. He uses his body really well. I'm not opposed to talking about LeBron here. I think if we had three teams, I might end up with LeBron on a team because because LeBron's still playing well. But to me, it's just clearly muted on the offensive end. And we go go back to what... I was saying about game planning, it changes the kind of situation where you're guarding him, in this case, Golden State. You don't have to bend and warp the entire thing around, you know, how are we going to stop a LeBron James back down pick and roll? Even the Anthony Davis LeBron James pick and roll has lost a little verve Mm -hmm. simply because I think of LeBron's foot injury right now. So I I wouldn't be too opposed if you want to try to stick him on here comparing to some of these guys, but. I think the other guys I mentioned to me would be my my final candidates. That's a really tough one. Um, I feel like with the the team that we have, I feel like another guard needs to be there. I really like the Anthony Edwards call out, but I don't know how I feel about like a first round exit. But is that unfair to him? Who 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 else did we have on this team? We let, said, let, we, wait, who else is on the team right the now? The second team right now. We have Embiid, Embiid, Harden, Harden Tatum, Durant, Tatum, Durant, and we need one more. Uh, at least one more guard, right? Do you think, I don't know, is it weird to have two Celtics on there? Does Jalen Brown... I, this is so I, tough, Ben. I like... Man, I like Anthony Edwards. Wow. I think... Let me think about this. Let's look at Let's look at Jalen Brown. Um, Jalen Brown is 25 points per 75, plus 5%. I, I could go either way. I think if you want to penalize for smaller sample and whatnot, and you don't want to include someone from the first round, you could easily move off of Anthony Edwards. I think, yeah, I think Jalen Brown would be my, my last guy on that team. If we're, cause if we're looking at guards, he's competing against Jamal Murray. He's competing against Anthony Edwards. Jalen Brown's really a forward, but we'll just, we'll just cheat and say like a guy who could slot into the two. We want a, We want a reasonable team here, right? We want James oh, Harden's our, James Harden's our point guard and beads our center. We've got Tatum and Durant at the wings. We, we need a squad if we're going to do this. We could also just put Kevon Looney on here and just call it good. <laughs> like He can be whatever position we want to play. Him, Al Horford, Andrew Wiggins, I don't care. Let's get one of these role players in here. First team, uh, all playoffs for us right now as of May 11th. Nikola Jokic, Devin Booker, Steph Curry backcourt, and um, Anthony Davis in the front court. Why am I forgetting? The fi- Jimmy Butler, Jimmy Butler, fifth player. If you want to support this show, check out patreon.com slash thinking basketball uh, for 
deluxe subscribers, we we provide the stats that we were looking at today. It's a our our stats board that updates regularly throughout the playoffs. I don't know about you, Cody, but I wake up every morning and I check it and I go, well, sorry, sorry, his his Devin Booker's shooting percentage is up to what? Uh, <laughs> Joel Embiid has what? Uh, Patreon.com slash thinking basketball. I cannot wait. I know this was the 200th episode, but I think the 201st episode uh, coming off this weekend where these series are going to end. Are we going to have, we're going to have the conference finals. I am absolutely stoked for, for next time to you. You want to say something before we get out of here? No, no. I think they're actually, I think the Miami Knicks series might be a Monday game seven if it goes there. So we should see at least three series done for sure. No, is it really? I'm pretty sure it's a Monday game. Wow. Uh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know how to end the show after that. We we will we will certainly see you back on Monday on the other side of the weekend. Enjoy the basketball. Thanks as always for listening. And of course, uh, I do hope you're having a great day.